Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar uh, titled Retrieval's Practice Strategies for Better Learning. My name is Stephen Wilshaw. I'm a science teacher here at North Anglia International School Hong Kong. I work predominantly with Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 students. Um, so that's around about between 11 and 16 year olds. However, I'm of the opinion that what we're going to talk today about today really is applicable across the school and regardless of the subject um, that you teach. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar today, please do, not, do send me a, a message on the chat function. Hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end to go through those um, questions. If we don't have time, I'm more than happy to share my email address where you can contact me through the school. And um, this is a subject I like talking to people about. It's a really interesting one. And the more, um, the more I talk to you guys, to be honest, the more I'll learn uh, about it myself. Okay, so let's get started. Um, before we really dive into it, it would only be fair of me to uh, point you in the direction of kind of the inspiration for this, um, uh, this PowerPoint. And that is this book that you can see on the screen. It's Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning. Now, honestly, um, I would like you to not be put off by the title and the cover of this book. Um, it's a really excellently written book. And to be honest, a lot of the pre presentation, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about is based on the work therein. You may be aware that retrieval practice is really a, a kind of a hot topic um, at the moment. And there are loads of books on this. If you Google retrieval practice, there's a ton. Um, but this is the one that I keep on coming back to. Um, so there's also a huge load of um, resources on the website, which you can see in the top right hand corner. So I would definitely refer you there as a next step. If you're interested, go there. They've got a bunch of free resources, no need to sign up for anything, no need to pay for anything. Um, to kind of summarize why I like the book, um, they're incredibly practical. I know as teachers, we're always looking at practical things which we can use in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> there's a really nice balance of theory and practice. I'm a scientist. I like to have my theories backed up by experiments. And those experiments really come up with very good evidence-based conclusions. They've taken real data across different key stages, different subjects, and really they do practice what they preach, these guys. Um, and they make it very, very simple. They talk about four what we call power tools. Um, uh, that's really something which we will be coming back to uh, during this um, session. I'll be talking to you about each of those power tools in turn. Um, if you would like even more on that, um, there's an excellent post on Cult of Pedagogy, um, which is on retrieval practice, and there's a podcast uh, with these guys, uh, the two authors who are, I, should, I should reference by name. Um, it's Ar Agarwal and Bain. They talk really, really nicely about the subject, so definitely those are a couple of things that you can get on with. Um, let's go for it then. So I did give you guys a bit of a, a, a quiz. Um, I mean, I think quiz is probably a very loose term for that. There wasn't, a, these weren't meant to be challenging questions. Um, the aim about my quiz, the aim of my quiz really to make you think about the kinds of knowledge that we have, uh, how we learn things, and the effect of storing information for uh, a long time. Okay. As I'm sure you're aware, remembering information is, or even learning information, is an incredibly complex process and involves many types of connections. If we go through the questions and I asked you, they're all very different. One, I kind of think is quite a muscle memory question. Um, you might know the answer to this question, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Because you might have the same thing every day. You might have cornflakes every day for breakfast. Or simply, um, it's just been such a short time since you had breakfast that it's not really a challenge for you to dig that back out of your, your brain. Question two is, is quite different. Um, for me, it's quite emotionally driven, as the answer is something you might quite hold, hold quite dearly to your heart, um, and you might be able to answer that, answer that fairly instantly, actually. Three is more maybe of a fact. Um, it's one which you learnt at school, might have been a geography class, might have been in a discussion, it could have been in all manner of contexts. What is of value is to consider how we have um, 
how we have learned that information. In other words, how we have encoded, how we've stored, and how we've retrieved the information. This is known as the three stages of learning. And that's what I want to just briefly touch on. I did talk about this very briefly in the, um, in the pre-webinar task, but we'll just go through that very, very quickly um, before we go on to these power tools. So, as we saw, um, our three questions had their differences. However, the process in trying to answer them is basically the same. Whenever we learn something, what we do is we are encoding it after we've learned something, and that's when we're, when we're learning something for the first time. After we've learned something, we then keep it in our minds, i.e. we store it. At a later point, we retrieve it. And that was what I was asking you to do when I was asking you those questions, is to try and retrieve those bits of information. Now, for me, the interesting thing about this is that the storage time is not quite as fundamental, not quite as key as you might expect. Information that you encoded recently um, and hence stored for a short time is not necessarily easy to retrieve. In the questions, I asked you about your breakfast today. However, if I'd asked you about breakfast or lunch or dinner from two or three days ago, you might struggle. It's been a short time, you've stored that information for a, a very short time, However, you might find it hard to retrieve it. However, there is a startling number of people who know Mount Everest's height, despite storing that number for decades. Think about our relative ages and where you first met that information. Um, I can still dig up an approximate height of Mount Everest, despite the fact it's been about 20, you know, if I'm being entirely honest, 30 years since I learned that. The difference is likely to do with retrieval and specifically how often we retrieve the information. Simply put, the more often we retrieve, the better we become at retrieving information. It's very rare that unless it was an amazing breakfast, maybe your birthday, maybe someone special cooked you it, that you will have to retrieve a meal. Now, what we need to think about is as teachers, what are we typically focusing on in our classrooms? I can speak from my point of view in that before about a year ago, I spent a hell of a lot of time encoding things. I spent a lot of time focusing on teaching my students new information, helping them to learn. And that's really part of our, that's really our job, isn't it? We want to make sure that students learn things um, in our classes. I think it's fair to say, unless, unless we're brain surgeons, storage is probably out of our hands. But how much time are we spending simply retrieving information in our classes? How much time are we asking students to access knowledge that they've already learned um, at a later date? Speaking honestly, I'd say I really reserve this to revision and exam preparation. And now it's very much a feature of my class and I genuinely think that students um, are a lot better off for this. And that's really the focus of today is to talk about how we can make those little tweaks in our classroom to allow more retrieval, more time for retrieval in our classes to benefit our students. On that note, um, if you'd like any more information, by the way, about the encoding process, please do have a look at this very nice brief and summary um, at Lumen Learning. Let's talk about these, the, the, the power tools, okay? Now, um, I'm gonna talk about four of these, and in each case, I'm gonna give you a little bit of data, like I've seen on the screen, I'll show you on the screen, and then I'm gonna give you a practical application of, the, of these power tools, and then we'll see how we can go on from there. Um, the first of uh, Agarwal and Baines' power tools is simply retrieval, um, practice itself. Okay, now retrieval is really, as I've said, a very simple idea that um, you access information you previously learned at a later stage. And you are definitely already doing this. It's the great thing about this stuff. I think a lot of teachers are going to feel a lot more confident when they read about these things because it's a lot of stuff you're doing already. If you're doing quizzes, 
you're doing retrieval practice. If you're doing, for example, tell me three, tell me three things you learned yesterday or today, um, you're already doing retrieval practice. The key point is to acknowledge that um, we have learned something before we put more in. We get the information out of our brains before we put it in. Now, I think this is fairly vague at this moment. I'm being deliberately vague. I think it's a really good idea to think about what retrieval practice kind of isn't. And I'll point you to the data, the graph that you can see on your screen. Um, this is some data I've stolen. Uh, from, there are references at the back that if you'd like to look at it a little bit more. A comparison um, between students who engaged in retrieval practice and a students who just engaged in a, a fairly passive activity of rereading. Okay, quite often before a test or something, we might say to students, simply reread the book and, um, and go on and, and, and then and that'll be a great way of preparing for your test. You can see there's quite a stark difference between uh, the data sets. You've got your rereading um, after a test, after five minutes of rereading, um, the rereading group actually studied, scored fairly highly, 83% in a little test. After, however, after one week, their scores dropped down to 40%. The group that did retrieval practice, so a, a more active bit of um, knowledge um, searching, may have not done quite so well on the initial test, but it's clear that they retained the information for a much longer time. And that is really what we're all about when we're teaching. We're not just teaching for the test, we're trying to teach students so that they learn things and are able to apply them at a later date. Could be a week, could be a month, could be a year. So the idea here is that we've got to be active as opposed to passive. Now, what does this mean? Um, what does this mean? Well, I'm gonna show you uh, an example of something that I use. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of iterate on this and we're gonna develop this. Now, I'm sure everyone's done this. Before, uh, um, a quit, before a, an assessment, sorry, one thing you might do is go, you know what, what are the things that my students need to know? You might give them a summary quiz. This is a quiz which um, focuses uh, on everything that we've got in the assessment, okay? All the questions are on the same topic, all right? In this case, for the, those scientists out there, this is on the, um, electricity course for year eight. And what I might do is I might give some feedback, I might mark the quiz, okay? The important thing here to focus on is those ideas, this is at the end of the unit, um, and, and we're really using this as a tool to kind of see where students are at. And what I personally find is whenever I do these kind of things, I, I get quite disappointed by the results. Um, however, I should be, shouldn't be disheartened because actually what I'm doing here is I am doing what we call retrieval practice. A quiz is the most basic way of asking your students to retrieve information that they previously learned. And so it's not a negative exercise to do, but what we're going to see is hopefully we can make some tweaks to, the, to this to make this a far more enhanced and far more useful activity um, which students can really use to benefit their long-term learning. So that's retrieval practice. We've got a summary quiz, bear that in mind and see how we change this as we go through the presentation. Let's look now at power tool number two, okay, which is spacing. Now spacing is really all about um, regularity. What we try and get across when we're doing retrieval practice is that we don't just ask them to retrieve once a term. We don't just ask them to retrieve just before the test. We don't ask them to retrieve um, on a kind of basis where we're really just trying to get all of the knowledge out. We think, let's do it regularly, ideally on a daily basis. If you're in primary, that's something you may have the um, chance to do. If you're maybe in um, secondary, you may have fewer opportunities to do that. You may see your students less often. I would argue this is even more valuable then. Okay, Spacing really does drive what we do every day. A lot of us will work in a spiral curriculum where we repeat topics. So topics get spaced. I know from my point of view that um, my students will learn some similar material in year seven, they do in year 10, and then even in year 12. So we do repeat things, we do space things, oh, sorry, um, we do space things as we go, okay? And um, we repeat, so the idea here is that we would do, we allow students 
um, to forget, okay, maybe on a yearly basis, on a weekly basis, whatever. However, we don't allow them to forget too much. We repeat the retrieval. Okay, now again, I want to point you in the, the what does this really mean? It's all about hand wave at the moment. And um, I want to point you in the direction of the study that I've, I've stolen the data of here. This is a, um, from a maths um, assessment, a group of, of academics did a study on math students, and they found that they gave um, two groups of students the same number of questions, say 20 questions. And what they said was, okay, in the cramming group, you guys have to do those questions to prepare for your test um, the night before the test. So 20 questions the night before the test, they did them to prepare, got a little bit of feedback, and then the next day did a test. The spacing group got the same number of questions. However, they did um, five questions each day in the four days in the lead up to the test. And again, you can see a pretty stark um, uh, contrast, again, the initial effect of the cramming, the doing before the, the day before test, has had a benefit. The score is marginally higher. However, at a retest four weeks later, you can see the effect, a huge drop off, exactly half the score of the spaced group. So simply taking that time to just do the test, to do those questions on a more regular basis, no more questions done, enhance the student's ability to retrieve the information and to be able to do well in their assessment. So how does it affect the quiz, the retrieval quiz that I showed you before? Well, simple thing. This is what I did in my lesson, by the way. All this is kind of real, real life example. I simply said, right, well, instead of giving uh, a quiz at the end of the unit, why don't I just give a daily quiz at the beginning of each lesson? Again, the questions are all on the same topic and I'll give some feedback, but I'm basically chopping it up um, for the students so that they can um, do things at a slightly more manageable pace. A side effect is that um, I actually was able to ask more questions because I could do six questions three times a week, 18 questions a week, as opposed to the 25 that I did in my end of unit test. I really think that they benefited just by that regularity, some repetition of questions, no problem at all there. So, we are reducing that cognitive load that the students have by doing this. Instead of, a, you can imagine being a student seeing 25 questions all on ele electricity, doing six, much more manageable, much more doable. Again, not rocket science, but we're simply um, relieving the load on them a little bit more. That's our spacing. We now go on to interleaving. Okay, now interleaving is a really nice one. I really like this one. This is where we take questions from different topics and mix them up from um, and mix them up with those from the current one. So again, you may be doing this if you're doing any kind of cross topic linking uh, in the sciences, we do this quite often. Um, okay, and um, and using random question generators, and um, you will see that we've you will be doing this already. Okay. The idea to hammer home there is that previous knowledge is just as relevant as current. And this is the point where I'm just looking at my PowerPoint and I've realized um, there's the wrong image on the screen, okay? Suffice to say, there is more data which shows exactly the same idea, that mixing up topics, um, mixing up questions versus simply asking questions all in the same topic improves the long-term memory. If anyone's interested in that, I can point you in the direction of the data. I wanted to show there and apologies for that. Okay. Let's look at this in terms of our daily quiz. Well, I've done this, um, I've, I've color coded things to make things a little bit more appealing to the eye. Okay. I've taken three questions from the most recent topic, so a physics topic in this case, and then I've just thrown in um, a couple of questions, three questions, sorry, from some other ones. In this case, these are questions that were taught earlier on in the year. You could do it earlier on within the key stage if you liked. It's up to you. You could choose questions deliberately in terms of um, maybe linking questions together. You might be wanting to introduce a new theme um, and di directly relate your answers uh, to that theme, or you can just go absolutely random. I like to go absolutely random because it keeps the students in their, on their toes. I really do think this is something that my students have benefited from because they know there is potential that they are going to be asked 
uh, um, about, <clears throat> about, about certain facts and certain bits of information. And I do think it's beneficial for them to know that it's going to be revisited, particularly in something like science, where we often move on at quite a heavy pace. Um, it's easy to forget all the information. Well, the act of retrieval, that training, that they're going to be asked about things, really, really does help um, them to perform in their exams. Okay, last one, and this is the wordiest one, last power tool is our, what they've called feedback-driven metacognition. For those of you um, who know meta metacognition is really that act of thinking about thinking. Okay, now this is, I, again, fairly, uh, when I first read about this stuff, I wasn't sure about it because um, I've never really seen the effect of, of metacognition presented in this way. Okay, really what you're doing here is you're asking students to reflect on their own learning and give an indication of how they feel the learning went. Again, if you're doing this, you could well be doing this already. Um, if you're doing red, amber, green questions where you're saying, um, if you are, you, you're asking the student to express themselves according to a color, could be a smiley face, could be an emoji. If you're asking them to do self-evaluations, um, then you're already doing that kind of idea. The idea being that they get to think about their own learning. Now the thing, I'd say the takeaway message from this one, which is really, really important, is that students are clever enough to think about or and to understand what this, this unwieldy term metacognition is. It's, it sounds like a high-end topic, it sounds abstract, but it's actually one that students really do engage in. And again, in the study, thankfully, I've put the right picture up this time, um, you can see the study here uh, where they basically done a comparison between students who simply sat a lecture and then did an exam, and then students who filled out what is called a metacognition sheet. And that's really just a feedback sheet. It's a, a, a process where the students are guided to say, how, how did you feel about this? Which areas did you find difficult? Which areas um, do you think you need to improve on? And simply the act of acknowledging your, um, perhaps your shortcomings or the areas that you are finding difficult is enough to really boost exam scores, in some cases by a huge amount. So if you look at that 85 versus 70, no real difference between the setup, just asking them to think a little bit. Okay, so we're on to the last stage of our, our um, well, what I've called the, meta, the feedback metacognition driven super quiz. That's me just being um, a bit too proud of myself. Okay, I took my quiz, I've got my daily quiz again, it's spaced, I'm doing it again and again at the beginning of every lesson, different questions each time, obviously. I'm asking my interleaved question, I've got three questions on the stuff we're um, studying right now and three from previous topics, but then I've, I've allowed the students to indicate confidence. What I've done is I've added a column to my table or to my uh, quiz, which allows the students to uh, enter a star or asterisk or a question mark. In my class, the asterisk means that they thought that they did pretty well in the question and the question mark means that they had a struggle. Um, and again, it's, I, I think this is really, really illuminating for the students who are kind of stuck between the two. We have got students in our classes who are gonna put every answer down as a star and they get them all right, fantastic. I'm sure we've all got students who are gonna put every question down as a question mark and they get them all wrong. But the, the really illuminating ones are the ones in between. Because what students tend to do is they tend to mark themselves down as it is much, much safer to assume that you don't know something um, instead of assuming that you do know something. It's fantastic to see their reaction to a student who has put down a question mark and then ends up actually getting the answer right. And when, I'm, when we do that, we're able to say, you know what, you need to have the confidence to, um, in your ability because you do know more than you think. And it's often that little jump in confidence which really helps students get more engaged and, um, and also to perform better in assessments, etc. So that's our quiz. And I don't really think that if you, I'm sure you're, a few of you are nodding your heads at, the, uh, at home thinking this is, not, this is not particularly new but it's tweaks. And I've found that this made a huge difference in my classroom. I think it's worthwhile just compare, comparing the before and after. If you were a student, what would you prefer? I personally, I know I'm biased, I would go for the one on the right, the after. 
a daily quiz instead of a daily quiz of small sort of a few questions versus a huge one at the last minute no brainer i would like to challenge myself to try myself to try and think about the recent topics and the topics that i learned before and i also want to be in that kind of atmosphere where i'm allowed to say look i'm not sure about this one um, or i think i've pretty much got this one and if i get it wrong why and that's where you as the teacher obviously can come in and say this is why and give some uh, positive feedback in that sense. Now, um, all of this uh, stuff that I've been showing you so far, as I said, is sort of real life stuff. It's stuff that I've tried out in my class, so I'm fairly confident with it. Um, however, when I first started doing it, I did wonder if my, how my students would react to um, being given a quiz every day. Uh, so what I did was I trialed the kind of cuddly version of the quiz with the uh, feedback driven metacognition, with the interleaving, with the spacing in there. And I asked for general feedback about my class. I didn't ask for feedback about the quizzes. I just wanted to know um, what should I keep doing in my classes. And there were loads of comments to the effect that you can see on the screen. I was really surprised by this. You can see things like we should continue doing the retrieval quizzes because they're a good way to dig into our memories. Continue doing the retrieval quizzes because they're, they're helpful and help me remember words I'll otherwise forget. Um, continue doing the retrieval tasks since it helps me understand what I would improve on. What makes me really happy about this is that there is student buy-in and I have noticed it just from the change of atmosphere in the class. They understand that the point of me doing these processes is not to collect data on them. I'm not phoning home to their parents. I'm not using it as a mark book. I'm simply trying to get them aware of their own learning. And again, as I mentioned before, they clearly understand what metacognition is. That is very impressive for key stage three. Uh, you're talking 11, 12, 13 year old students. I'm really happy with it. So with that in mind, I want to um, point you, I'm aware that we are running down in time. What I'd like to do just now, just at the end is, um, is give you an, an, a, a useful resource that you might find useful in your classroom, and then maybe talk about other ways of doing retrieval in the classroom. And this resource that you can see on the screen is one of the best resources that I've come across in the past years. And it's by a teacher in the UK called Adam Boxer. And what he does is he designs it so that um, teachers can create a database of questions like the ones that you've seen in the quizzes that I've been generating. And you can choose a start point and an end point. And then the, sp the spreadsheet then generates quizzes of different lengths with randomly selected interleaved questions. So for example, you could choose a quiz, as it says, on, as you can see on the board here, uh, sorry, on the, on the display here, a 10 question uh, quiz, which has got questions from the current topic. And then you've got interleaved questions just on the top. And obviously the answers are generated as well. The, the spreadsheet generates um, other types of quizzes as well, blank versions for students. It really is a fantastic resource. Um, he, this guy, Adam Boxer, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it because his website is incredibly well constructed. He's posted videos instructing students and instructing parents how to use this spreadsheet. So if you have a complete database of questions that you want students to know, I mean, it doesn't have to be for everybody. It could be for students who think are maybe particularly struggling with some basic knowledge points you can issue them this one and get them to do the um, learning at home in the support of their, their parents. And I think this is a really nice idea. Um, he calls it the retrieval roulette because you're kind of randomly choosing. Um, and I really would recommend having a look at the link that I've put at the bottom of this, um, of this PowerPoint. If you search for Adam Boxer retrieval roulette, it will come up It's a free resource and it's a fantastic one, which I use on a daily basis. Um, Let's talk about just some other very small retrieval strategies just as a, as a kind of end point. Quizzes are one thing, but I, I mean, I've now started taking things that I normally do um, in the class and modifying them. So the game of bingo will not be a new one to anybody. However, I modified it to make it into what I call retrieval bingo. And what I do is I write up 16 keywords on the screen from different topics. I might choose eight from the current topic and then uh, eight from previous topics. I then put those words on the screens and I asked the students to generate definitions. After a short amount of time, um, I then choose the best definition, inverted commas there, 
and then the students choose nine of those words for bingo. So we've got kind of layered approach there. We've got the students generating the definitions, students giving feedback on each other's definitions, and then the retrieval during the game of bingo. So you're adding that really extra top layer instead of just saying, what is the definition of X? What is the definition of Y? You are asking them to generate it. And that process of dig digging into their brain is retrieval um, at its simplest. Here's another nice one about metacognition. This is the metacognition lineup. What you can do is you can ask students to simply retrieve a piece of knowledge. It could be something you've taught um, previously. It could be something very complex or it could be something very uh, simple, it's up to you. These retrieval techniques are not limited to, to lower order blooms. There are, you can go for higher order, explaining, analyzing questions, all work with this. Ask them to retrieve, and then ask them to line up according to confidence. Say to them, if you're feeling confident about your answer, go to one side of the room. If you're, in the, if you're middling with your confidence, middle of the room, and then on the other side, if you're not so much. They then share their ideas with the person next to them, and then share their ideas with those at the opposite end of the line. And each time they're sharing, you're giving them the opportunity to think about that, um, their confidence levels, they can reproduce, reposition themselves if they're starting to feel a bit more confident. And obviously at the end of the exercise, you ask the students, perhaps those with the lowest confidence, to give their answers. And then hopefully by sharing those and showing they're actually, they shouldn't be at the at the wrong end of the line, as it were, you're giving them that confidence. The simplest of all the, the strategies I've read about is one called the brain dump. And again, when I first read about this, I thought this was a bit too simple, but it's fantastic. The idea of the brain dump is to pause the lesson. Ask the students to write down anything they know on a specific topic. It's gonna to be fairly broad, so you could say, for example, photosynthesis. After a minute, ask students to swap brain dumps with their neighbor and ask the neighbors to add something new which there wasn't there originally. Really, really simple, very short activity. All of these retrieval activities, by the way, should be short. We don't want to get in the way of encoding. We don't want to, get, don't want to lose time in terms of teaching our curriculum. We're all under pressure, but taking two, three minutes to just jump in, do some retrieval, and then leave again seems to be incredibly, incredibly effective. I tend to do these brain dumps at the beginning of the lesson, and I tend to choose topics which are linked to the, um, what we're gonna be doing that day. However, in the book that um, I showed you guys, they've talked about doing it absolutely randomly. Um, you know, if you're in the middle of studying a chemistry topic, suddenly throwing in a biology one, get the students to retrieve, and then move on with the chemistry lesson. It's up to you how, to use, how you use it, but getting them into the, the habit of retrieving is, um, is really the key here. Last one, and this is stolen directly from um, Boxer's sheet. This is, um, this is uh, Blockbusters, maybe a game that you guys uh, have played. It's certainly a game show that I remember, showing my age because my students don't remember it. Um, this is generated by the, by the retrieval roulette sheet that I showed you guys earlier from Adam Boxer. It's simply a, another way of, of reformulating a quiz, but I found this really good for end of, so preparation for kind of multi-subject quiz um, tests, so for example, end of year tests where you might be studying across a few different units. You can produce a map like this, and the idea is that the students are trying to uh, get from the left-hand side to the right-hand side by answering questions. If they get the question right, they own the hexagon and they're trying to form a line from left to right it could be um, a straight across or it could go round depending on whether they get the questions right or not you could have two students playing this um, or you could have three with one uh, student acting as the um, as the adjudicator the judge and again that's giving a chance for a little bit of feedback a little bit of peer review always goes very well um, and then you can ask them to rotate, rotate around. This particular, I keep this one in because my, this was very, very popular with my students in the uh, preparation for a recent end of term uh, test. So those are um, four, well, five in total different ways of doing retrieval. I'm, sh I'm aware that that's quick and it's a really a snapshot um, into what kind of things you can do in the classroom. I do hope that that's been helpful. Um, as I mentioned, we have a bibliography there. Um, I do want you to 
uh, be aware that, <laughs> that the, the reference I did point to exists. Um, so if you would like to look up any of these uh, studies that I've mentioned, please do feel free. Half an hour is not long to uh, explain everything. At this point, I'd ask if anybody's got any questions they'd like to put in the chat or any comments or anything like that. I did notice that um, there was a comment about uh, brain dumps. Absolutely. Um, I think that's Iris who's mentioned that. Iris, try the brain dump in your class. It's the easiest thing you ever easiest teaching method that you'll ever use um and it's a very surprising the things that um that people come up with okay is anybody going else got any questions if you don't have any questions um i really would like some feedback from you it's the first time i've ever done um a webinar for nord anglia and um, i do hope you found it interesting i'd be happy to talk to anybody if they're interested um, but definitely please for, follow the address on the link on the website um, and give me some feedback. Let me know if you found it interesting. Okay. It looks like we've got no questions at this point. Okay. So I think I'm going to uh, call it a day. Many thanks for all of you attending. Um, hopefully we'll hear from some of you at some point soon. Warm regards.